welcome you to just a wonderful conversation with some wonderful dynamic sisters. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Annie Ruth. I'm doing this great, exciting art commission called Truth and Reconciliation. But I actually did a session called On Her Shoulders because I really want people to hear the voices of us Black women. We've got a lot to say, both happy, all kind of emotions kind of flow through it. So I am joined this evening. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited by my sister friend, Sharon M. Draper. And many of you all know Sharon. She's like a multi career woman. She is a retired educator, uh, 1997 National Teacher of the Year, and also a very accomplished author. We are so excited to have Sharon. We got an AKA in the house, not an AKA sorority, but we have Dr. Tanya Matthews, but she has an alias. A.K.A. Ja Hipster. She is an awesome, accomplished, spoken word artist, writer, extraordinaire. But guess what? Her degree is in, help me out, Tanya, bio. Bio Biomedical engineering. Yes, man. All right. I'm going to talk, I'm going to dive a little bit into this artwork. I named my segment On Her Shoulders because I know I don't do this journey alone. I'm standing on the shoulders of some phenomenal women. And you actually are two of the women whose shoulders I stand on. So I'm I'm excited about that, y'all. Um, so anyway, I wanted to dive in really quickly, and then we'll just take the conversation a little further. This artwork, I'm actually I'm creating 12 mural-sized paintings. And oh, yeah, so this, I've actually already completed six of them. But the one we're going to talk about tonight is called Your Silence is deafening and it y'all it's just personal as i i looked around at what's happening in the world so i said okay how can i depict what i'm feeling because i have i have some caucasian friends and friends of other nationalities and i was kind of like this you know your silence is deafening it's saying a lot more than you think it's saying you know, you might say, oh, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I don't have anything to say. But your silence is speaking volumes. So in this piece, I depicted, um, I, I kind of wrestled with, because it's a multi, multi-theme multi piece, I kind of wrestled with, because it's not just about, oh, my white sister's silence is deafening. It also talks about our silence being deafening in other areas, too, like if, I'm witnessing child abuse and I don't speak up or speak out about it. That says a lot as well. So I, I had the, I said, what am I going to do with the lips? So I put this big black X, could be like or whatever across the lips and there's very strong um, Afrocentric features. And I, I kind of had the person holding their ears, but the fingers I kind of made to look like steps. So there's a lot of symbolism flowing through the art. I'm, I'm curious, you know, as artists who paint, I'm curious to see what my creative sister saw in, in that piece, you know? Um, who wants to dive in for that one? I was taken at first with the eyes because the eyes are so powerful and there's levels of them. There's, the, there's the, the lash of the eyes, I mean, the brow of the eyes, then there's the eyeball, then there's the white of the eyes, and then behind that, there's the shadows, mm. you know, because what we hide behind our eyes are many, many layers of shadows and pain and hurt and despair, and they stay there in our eyes. So that was the part that grabbed me first, was the eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and Annie, well, first, let me just say out loud, congratulations. You know, as, as we're having all these conversations about representation and who makes these choices and, and all that kind of thing, for them to give an African-American female sister artist a check and a paintbrush and say, go. That's something special. Um, but as you said, they were looking for someone who had been in the game for quite some time. So I want to uh, acknowledge that. And and you, you know, you brought up the X. And, and I have to say, the first time I, I looked at it, I kind of avoided the X 
because it confused me. I was like, ooh, that's, I didn't do, ooh, I don't know what to do about the ex, you know? And so I, I had to come back and I realized, I think what I was juggling with is sort of, it made me think of the difference between, you know, your tongue being tied and your tongue being bound, right? So tongue tied is in that, I don't know what to say, right? I, I, I don't I don't even know how to articulate, you know, what I'm seeing if you're a watcher or what's happening to me if you're if you're in the space. And then there are times when say a tongue may be bound, right? When you are under orders not to speak. Those may be explicit orders, those may be implicit orders, this may be things you have learned to never say kind of out loud. Um, and, and it's, and it, so that was, I think, very interesting because I could see, you know, different people, both, um, you know, for, for clarity's sake, oppressor and victim being on both sides of that X, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter because either way, as you titled it, the silence is still definite, right? Even if you have a good reason or even perhaps a reason beyond your control, for not being able to to speak, it's still that that silence just still it still says so much and allows so much and accidentally gives approval um, to to so much and so I was really working around the X. <laughs> working around the X. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you too, as an artist trying to really um, really represent what I was feeling, I kind of wrestled with. The, the tone of her face, um, you know, because I, I didn't want it to be an indictment to my white brothers and sisters, but I, I also did want them to get the message. But at the same time, I didn't want it to be the only message that was flowing about that piece, right? And so I said, okay, after a while, choosing not to speak, then begins to say a lot more then, you know, so it's like, if, if, is your silence going to say the opposite of what you want it to say? So I'm just, I'm loving the multi layers of things. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, when they're looking at my artwork, it's no right or wrong answer, because as the viewer, you are bringing so much of your own uh, perception and perspective to what you're viewing, you know. Mm -hmm. Was there, yeah. there any other elements that st stood out to you all besides the, just the, the facial features and the... Well, if you look down, mm -hmm. there's a second set of eyes, you know, and it's like, I see, you know, because I'm scrolling it as I'm looking at it on my screen, yeah. and I see the face, and I see the mouth that has been silenced, and then as I scroll up, I said, there's another set of eyes, there's another, there's another person in there you know the, the eyes that the tears are coming out of yeah so it's like many of us are more than one of us you know we have more than one self the self perhaps that we show to family to friends the self that nobody else knows or sees and Maybe that's the second self, but, you know, because I looked at it first and then I said, oh, there's another self, self there. <laughs> I really like that. Well, and that's really interesting because the fact that it was uh, two faces to me was one of the first things I saw. I saw like two people kind of doing doing this. And as I'm listening to um, to Sharon sort of describe the, the layers, of course, one of my favorite poems is coming to mind, which is We Wear the Mask. Oh, yeah. That grins and lies, that shields our face and hides our eyes. I have remembered that ever since I was, I was a kid. And so part of it is your artistic style that I'm familiar with, which is almost kind of a mosaic kind of, of color. And usually I'm just like, oh, that's nice. But she's mixing all these tones and colors. But but this time, you know, I'm also getting a bit of the mask, right? I'm, I'm also getting a bit of the mask and, and the tears are leaking out the mask. Like the mask isn't really strong enough. Like the tears are, are coming back. And, um, you know, Sharon saw the the layers in the eyes. And, and I, this is why I like having this conversation because now I see it um, because what I saw in the eyes, tired, tired, <laughs> I saw two very tired, just, just tired eyes, like, like doing everything they can just, just to keep 
just to keep their eyes open. And I think, you know, particularly, you know, as, as we had a lot of very sort of real conversations, um, some heard, some unheard um, during uh, the, the pandemic, I think one of the things that at least did come out, um, at least I know that, that um, you know, Black folks could talk among themselves was how tired we were. We actually started to, to really talk more vocally about, hey, your African-American colleagues, your Black co-worker, not all right. Right. Just just very just very tired. There, there's a whole lot of intersectionality going on right now. And, and we're 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 waiting to figure out the straw that you know that's gonna that's gonna break the camel's back and sort of that kind of thing. And um, you know, it's interesting. The pictures to me are also a bit genderless. Like I, I feel like I can infuse, you know, some whatever gender, but I'm infusing my own, right? You know, so I'm I'm seeing, you know, uh, a black female and I'm like, yeah. We tie. <laughs> just we, so I, I really, um, I really resonated with that and sort of what you what you did with the eyes. Um, you know, eyes so tired that they want to close, but they're still open because yeah. got to stay vigilant and, and we got work to do. You, you are so right, I, and I think and you all probably know that as, as an artist, whether we're coming out with our pen or our brush. We can't help but to pour our soul into what we're creating. And so a lot of what I was experiencing, even with all the COVID, was also personal challenges. Because um, during that time, my mom had passed away. So a lot of a lot of art, um, even during that time, I was really pouring my heart and soul. Matter of fact, you remember the, when the Black Lives, when I did the Black Lives Matter mural uh, downtown uh, Cincinnati on, on the street? That was so therapeutic for me um, because we needed to release it. I um, like give example going back to the uh, George uh, Floyd murder, right? Mm-hmm. That took so much out of me as a black woman because when he called Mama, that's like the universal call of every black child. With you know, I'm a, I don't know about you guys when you were younger. We always call for mama whether she was around or not. If there was pain or hurt, <laughs> you know, if a dog was, dog was chasing you, you'd be like, mama, you know, so I can... <laughs> but I, you know, I was like, wow. It, so, so it just allowed me that chance to really pour, pour out what I was feeling too. Onto the case. And, you know, I, I think that our, our strategies for, for healing, you know, kind of kind of in this time, you know, I see I see two tired people sort of sort of in your picture. And, and depending on what I'm thinking about, you know, they're drawn a little different. So maybe I'm thinking they have different backgrounds and you bring up, um, you know, that 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 moment, that the big moment around George Floyd. And I I remember I remember the day of the funeral, right, the, the day that they they did the broadcast of of the funeral and I knew that I was going to take time and, and I was going to watch that I had some meetings I was like not going to the meeting because today we got a thing right. so it was it was one on one hand it was very interesting there was a sense of owning my own power right I don't have to explain anything to y'all I'm about to tell y'all today is the day of the funeral so I'm not going to be in this meeting no, no listen what, what you don't say like like you couldn't you couldn't say anything so there was one you know there was there was that moment of, of, of power and then the moment of vulnerability was, you know, I realized I, I didn't want to watch it alone. Okay, it's a pandemic. It's in the heart of the pandemic right right then. And I, I didn't want to watch it alone. And so, you know, you Zoom and all that kind of stuff, share screen. And I had a small sort of watch party. Party isn't the right word. We had a watch party, you know, and so we, you know, we watched it together. And even though we couldn't see each other because we didn't have screens on or anything like that, I could, I could feel that we were there and that there were some there were some things in the in the um the chat and i could cry by myself but not cry alone and i think what was really important to me is that i um, you know, I, I brought in some of my closest friends and that actually was a mixed community right so um so it, it wasn't all you know um black folks but it was all sisters right um and and i think that was that was very important, um, allowing me to be authentic in my pain and not default just to anger, 
right? So, you know, that, that, that I think that, I think that helped. And so I see some of that in, in the picture because it's clearly two different faces. I don't know what their story is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, they, but they look like two faces, but they're obviously really close to each other. Um, I don't know who's holding up who or something like that, but when you, when you brought up that, that moment, that's been where the, where the picture took me. Another thing, um, talking about the pandemic and being alone and being isolated and staying in and not being able to hug somebody, not being able to share with another human was so isolating and so overpowering. And I kept thinking about women who were caught in situations where they could not escape. It, it used to be I could get out of the house and go to work and I'd be away for a while, but there were women who were trapped with abusive spouses who could not escape. There was no escape. You could not go outside. And if you went outside, there was no place to go. There was nothing that was open. There was no toilet paper. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was just overpowering. And I kept thinking about all of these women who were trapped in places from which they had no escape. And so I, when I saw this, the painting, I thought about that. I thought about those women mm -hmm. and what they were enduring, what they were going through. They had no escape. They had nobody to tell nobody to talk to. And the same thing for children. Right. You know, yeah. the kids who lived in abusive homes, they used to be able to go to school and be loved by a teacher for a couple of hours a day, get something to eat, come home, and they could survive because I get to go to school tomorrow and I get to see other people and I don't have to be in this environment. There were an awful lot of children who suffered through that lockdown because it was not just, hey, we're out of school and this is fun. It was awful. It was horrible. It was terrifying. And we, we will not know for years the ultimate effects that it had on those children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, um, you know, out of doing all of those pieces, it just, you know, the multi-layered of things, because how you all said, I'm glad you saw the two uh, distinctive people, uh, but I also kind of made them um, one, two and one, almost like, I don't know if you can see as she's kind of holding her ears, the next person almost goes up and almost like she's in her brain, like in her hair, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and Tanya, I, and I thought of your lovely hairstyles when I was... <laughs> Well, you, but you know what it also, you know, took me to, sometimes it's, you know, it's just blood memory. It's, you know, some of the masks that, that are worn on the continent are also like that, right? Like when you're, you're wearing the mask of, of sort of a different face. Um, and, and you know that there's the one where I'm looking at the eyes and I see the fatigue and, and the layers. Um, it also depended on what mood I was in. Because okay. there's also a mood that I'm in and I will look at that top figure and I'll be like, she, she got this look. Y'all know the look, right? Right? She is like, I am done. I'm, I'm so, I'm so bored with your excuses right now. You know, I'm just, mm -mm. I no, I'm not. This is no energy. I'm not giving you any energy in this. I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm gonna let you listen. Mm -mm. I'm not, not, not today. You hit it on the head because I'm. A, I don't know about you guys' experience, but I have had the experience where you know you kind of like. You're tired of explaining, like before COVID and everything in the lockdown. It's almost like, do I have to re-educate people all the time? Do, you know, and, and you know, amongst ourselves, sometimes we just say, I'm tired of, t you know. And it was so easy to play ignorant. I mean, people always had this easy to play ignorant role uh, until one thing COVID did was you couldn't play like you didn't see it. You couldn't play ignorant. It was just there, bam, in your face. And did you all get this? It went from one extreme to the other. You either had a, a friend who was like, oh, I'm not carrying all that guilt. And then you had a friend who carried too much, where, you know, every time.
time you would see them, they were like crying, like, oh, I'm so sorry for what we, we've done to black race. And did you, have you guys had, had those experiences? Yes, yes. The, the, the lady across the street who came and wrote us a letter and said, we apologize for all of our people. I mean, they took it upon themselves, but they, they're really, really nice people. But they came and they apologized for 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 history, for everything. Like, it's not on you. It's you know, thank you, but it's it's not on you. Listen, if any of my neighbors are watching, feel free to write me a letter. Uh, <laughs> But I, you know, and it was really interesting because y'all maybe remember back in the day, there was an episode of Oprah, it all circles back to Oprah. There was an episode of Oprah where um, it, it was actually an apology project, apology show, but it was male, female. And she had um, an audience full of men who was ready to simply apologize to, to women they didn't know, like on behalf of. These are women who have been, some, there was some hurt or some trauma or something, and they paired them up with, with a man. And, and that man, who had no relationship with this woman, apologized to her, sort of, sort of on behalf of and sort of that kind of thing. And while I thought it was interesting, I didn't quite get it. I was like, does that... I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not in that situation. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I would say sort of like during this period, um, while I may want to tweak the tactic, I did sort of begin to, to get it. And it wasn't the apology so much as it was an acknowledgement that I was being seen Okay. Right. Like that. That's that's the thing, right? And that that's a nuance. You still go. You can go through and you can say, "I'm sorry." But what what I heard was, I see what's happening, and I realize that it's been happening, and I didn't see it until right now. And but now I see, right? Like like that's all I'm trying to say. I like I see you. I don't know what else to say. So and I realized um, that there were moments when it was coming from a really good place. It actually did mean something. Um, and I wanted to say another thing about the picture because I have it up on the screen oh, yeah. next to me here. Um, is the color behind the woman, the bright orange and the bright yellow. When I see orange and yellow, I think hope, okay. I think joy. Okay. You know, and you know, blues and grays, I think, okay, you know, it's going to rain today. But the orange and the yellow, in spite of the despair on her face, there is hope and there is joy. Yeah. And that's real subtle, but it's, okay. yeah, I don't know if you met it or if you just artistically knew it, but I really like that orange and that yellow on either side. Well, you know, I am a colored person, so, you know, the, the colors will always yeah. have some significant, um, you know, yellows are always, you know, for me, representative of, of spirit and, and of the hope and of just that that whole positive, warmer uh, outlook. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I, I had, I don't know if you can tell, I actually used um, wallpaper, textured wallpaper oh. within oh. that. Wow. Oh, that was that yeah. is down there. Okay. I know sometimes with a reproduction, so that's one thing about viewing something in person versus the reproduction. On, in person, mm -hmm. you can see all of the layers of texture because it looks like like some of the whites in there are like little blocks that look like they're building building up. But you know, one thing I did notice too that happened with the whole um, uh, consciousness of everything in the front of people, mm. a lot of, of my white sisters began to say, let me step back and you tell me how I can best help you. Before that, we were getting Oh, I think, you know, somebody can come out with a great idea. This is a great idea for black folks to do, and you guys do that. But I, I saw a lot of my sister friends stepping back and said, Annie, what can I best do to help you? And, and let me take the lead. And, and that's actually how this, this the grant project kind of happened as well behind the scenes. A lot of um, sisters were saying, let black people take the lead on what kind of projects they want to do and what voice that they want to to share mm -hmm. 
One of one of the things I, I like um, that I think is, is 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 so much a part of you um, that you're that you're doing, as Sharon mentioned, the colors. You know, the colors are vibrant. They they are bright. They are they are not necessarily heavy, right? This is this is a dark conversation. These these are heavy feelings, and so you know, I could easily see another artist choosing an entirely different kind of color palette, right, to, to sort of get this, but. But, you know, I'm sort of taking some instruction um, from your work as, as, you know, as I step into uh, my new role at the International African American Museum, which is how do you get in conversation with these tough stories? If it looks scary from 100 feet away, you will make a left turn <laughs> the corner before you get there, right? But it, but it is bright and it is vibrant. And I wouldn't necessarily say it's inviting. It's kind of like showstop. It's not like, what's that? I mean, it's bright, it's, it's yellow, it's orange. Is that two faces? Is that supposed to be a face down on the bottom? Like, what, what am I thinking? And before folks are really fully, you know, engaged, they are fully welcome and, and they're in the space. And the first thing I think that you've triggered is curiosity, mm. right? And I and I think that that kind of opens the door just, just a little bit to have, you know, kind, kind of a heavier, heavier conversation where you, you can feel it out, right? If, if you're looking okay, I see two sad people, one's crying, that's as far as I can go today. Okay, all right. Versus, you know, some days you might you might want to go farther and sort of get into the eyes. So I really like what you've done. Um, I think, you know, the formal term, people would say it's approachable. I would actually say that it is inviting, right? It, it's literally kind of inviting you to come and figure out what all these colors and two heads are about, sort of that kind of thing. And I think that that is um, an incredible tactic um, to, to help us get into conversations, um, you know, that, that would be that heavy um, and, and get that complicated. Hey, Sharon, did you notice she snuck one in on us? Okay, she, we got we to, okay, she, 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 rerun. My sister, I know congratulations are in order. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. CEO of the International African American Museum. Woo, hey, woo. <laughs> Uh, and I will, I will give a, like a, even a double double shout out because of course Annie and I's uh, history is is global, right? So uh, so she and I uh, got to travel to uh, to Kenya uh, together. We were working on sort of a, an international project. So you know everything's running everything's running full circle, full, full circle. Uh, this this is a, a global uh, conversation uh, in terms of that. So taking all of those um you know those those lessons from from there and here and and uh and weaving weaving it together well you know what uh, we we love you dearly we are so so godly proud we know you're going to do a great job and honestly I, i'll put it right out here if you ever need me you know i am just a text or a phone call away on the plane for my sister friend yeah. Well, listen, I think, as I mentioned, I think that art is a powerful way into this conversation, right? Be that visual arts, be that poetry, be that storytelling, short stories, long stories, novels, you know, this, I think, is the way that people can can get into this space. Um, just like, you know, obviously, you know, my background's on like the math and science side. Some folks just love math, math, math. Some people love, you know, some folks got a problem to be solved. And they're only going into this math thing because someone told them they could solve their problem, right? And I think on some of these conversations, the art works the same way. There are some people who are into history, right? And they eat it and they they drink it and they love to dig. And there's some folks like, nope, 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 nope. Only if I have kind of a specific question. But when you talk about art, it's well, well, what kind of art? Yeah. Poetry? Mm, what, what what kind of poetry? Stories? Which story? Who? Which which author? So there's there's a doorway for everyone when you use art if you're if you're willing to to open it. And so I'm sure that I will need uh, your your guidance. And I'm taking a couple of your pieces with me. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be up in the office uh, so that I, I remember uh, sort of where where uh, my strength comes from and where the story is still living. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Um, Thank you. The ring on her finger, the jewelry. Yeah. You know, 
Why does she have that ring on? Is that a wedding band? It is. It's okay. a wedding band. It is. All right. I wondered. I said, is that a wedding band or is that just a ring? And that that says something. That that yeah. gives her a different identity. You yeah. Know? And the and the armband, you know, has so many different colors. And if you look at it closely, there's flags, there's uh, there's history, there's you know, there's an awful lot of things in there. So when I look at art, I like to look at it more than once because when you look at it the second time, you see something different, and the third time you see something different, and you're called in a different way. And that's what makes this piece powerful because every time I look at it. I see something different. It is. It is. You know, amazingly enough, it, it is a wedding band because I wanted to make sure that the conversations about domestic violence also enter into that. Um, you know, the, the beautiful jewelry, if you look really hard at it, there actually is a chain in the background. So okay. I, I was wondering about that. I was like, I, I think I also see chains. Okay. okay. I, wanted, I wanted the um, conversations of domestic violence. I wanted the conversations of uh, enslavement. Uh, of mm. I wanted to come in because our silence it can go so many detrimental oh. ways. Um, you know, for me, growing up um, as a teenager, I experienced uh, an older gentleman that tried to sexually molest me. Mm. Right? And I was fortunate that I could talk to my sister and other adults around me. But I'll be honest with you, I never told my mom, even to my mom's, you know, she, she went to her grave not knowing that that happened. Because I knew that my, cause my mom had a big shotgun in her closet. And I knew that she would have killed the person. I'm just, uh huh, uh huh. Believe she would have. But I did also go. I went to other adults to help navigate that particular um, issue. Imagine the silence of someone who's carrying the weight of abuse and domestic violence and all kind of stuff. It it can get really really heavy. So. Uh huh. And I. A springboard. Yeah, I think you know, with, with all the, the layers, and, and thank you, you know, for for sharing uh, that that bit of your story. And I think part of, of the conversations I've started to have is things around. It's not a mentor; it's mentors. It's not a tribe; it's tribes. It's not a sister; it's sisters. And and being able to use your your entire community um, in all of its different geniuses, right? You, there may not be one person you can tell everything to, but that, that doesn't mean you should be quiet about it, right? You can you can find folks, um, particularly for, for those who, who have the horror stories of mm, they chose the wrong person to tell, right? And and the, the the response and the reaction was was not you know what they what they needed. Um, and as you were seeing all these layers, and you see this, and I see that, and that kind of thing, the take home message here for our viewers is that when you go see Annie Ruth's mural, this is a group viewing activity. You need to be sure to take a whole bunch of folks with a whole bunch of different perspectives and just to stand there um, as different people, you know, pull pull out, you know, sort of different things and, and different different pieces. Um, it's just amazing, um, you know, that, that all of these, these layers, it'll take us as a group to understand the one mind. Yeah. Danny Ruth. And then we still gonna miss some things. <laughs> we still gonna miss some things. Oh my goodness. I um you know, it came to mind, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before, and it's kind of like a, a churchy type of uh, perspective, that some testimonies are meant to share in a wide group, mm. but some testimonies are meant to share one-on-one, -on -one mm. because everybody can't handle your testimony, and your testimony is not meant for everyone like some of the like i share um my my battle with uh struggling with low self-esteem I, I write that in my poetry a lot so i share that in an open um forum and we've analyzed the poems and talked about it but there's things i've experienced in life that i've only shared with one or two 
but the great thing about you just the whole sisterhood network is you share it with those sisters who can lift your arms up and hold you. So mm-hmm. you know, as we were diving into the themes of even more of the artwork, um, I actually have, even though this one actually has a mask-like impact on it, I got another one coming up called We Wear the Mask and really diving, diving into that mask. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so, you know, your last comment actually gave me some thoughts about, I guess, the next piece um, that we are going to um, to talk about, which is, I think the other thing that I found out, you know, we all found out some amazing things about ourselves uh, in the pandemic. Um, I, I think one of the other things that I found out is that there was a significant amount of this alone time that I really appreciated. And that I really value, right? And for the first three months, it was kind of like, well, this is good, of course. I mean, it's a different pace. You kind of doing your own thing. You get to control and manage your world. But as I as I really begin to um, to recognize that that I was being filled by by that silence and that space, it also then allowed me to ask, okay, so when you're not isolated, what what pressure is on you that you are enjoying this reprieve from? And so over the past uh, year, you know, I've, I've had, frankly, the courage um, to sit still and, and be in that kind of conversation um, uh, as, as well. And so I've realized also I've, I've enjoyed that. And these are things that I, I intend to preserve um, even as we're coming out of this space. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have um, done and as I we've learned to talk in little boxes, yes. And we've learned to uh, communicate in little boxes. Um, I I have had a chance to talk to teachers and students around the country, and I've been giving a little assignment at the end of every one of these little Zoom sections sessions, and I think that's a good thing to offer to people who watching this is it's vitally important that we write down and you know I'm going to do something about writing but (laughs) but it's important that we write down our our memories of 2020 2020 my last plane flight was February 28th and Airport shut down, the world shut down, toilet paper went missing, right. everything stopped. And we were different from the beginning of the pandemic to now as we seem to be coming out of it. And I think people should write down what was it like? What was it like to to be by myself all day, every day? What was it like to have nobody to talk to, to have nobody to hug, to have no, um, I mean, besides telephone and, and, and electronic means, we had no means of being together with other people. And it changed us. And I tell children, I said, I want you to write down what you remember about what it was. Once you got over the joy of, yay, we don't have school for a couple of months, what was it really like? What was the good parts about being at home? What was the bad parts about being at home? Save that, because when you grow up and become an adult, you can tell your kids, yes, I lived through 2020. And Mm -hmm. this is what I remember. This is what it was like. This is what we had to do. This is what we thought was going to be cool, but we got really, really sick of. And so um, I'm leaving that to everybody as a as a as a homework assignment, a gift. Write down your memories of this period of how it affected you personally, spiritually, emotionally, so that people will know. Because we, we are forgetting kind of people. We just kind of move on and, oh, look, this is over. And I'm here down yeah. in Florida and there's 9 million children on the beach partying, like, because it's spring break. And they, you know, and they think they're immune to, to every bad thing. Yeah. But we need to remember what it was like. And we need to tell our children what it was like and our grandchildren. So that's my 
homework assignment to everybody is to write down your memories of the year of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. I knew that teacher, I knew that teacher was <laughs> Listen, and I and I think it's, it's, a, it's a good assignment. I'm almost like I'm about to like try to go into my desk here because I started the assignment then you know that I that I stopped like in the beginning I was like everybody else I had my corona diaries. It was like day one day 12 you know i was i was doing sort of pretty pretty good um and i need to 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 sit back in that space um and i'm, I'm also very curious as i'm coming out of it right um you know i um i think um for many folks you know this has been um a mixed a very mixed bag right it's sort of a a very mixed bag and I, there are parts of me that are as um, tentative about coming out of this as I was going in, right? Because there's some, like, I walk, like, every day now. I don't, like, I haven't moved, right? It's just, you know, I just, I just got into walk. I'm, I'm afraid that, that, that all the distractions will come back in and I, and I won't be walking anymore. I know my family health history. I need to be outside every day walking, right? Um, so those, you know, those kinds of things, the being able to, to sit still and to, and to take respite, you know, if I, I had to write an essay and probably like, dear neighbor, I'm sorry for not missing you. Let me try to explain why. <laughs> Right. So those, those kinds of, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, I also, I think like a lot of folks, I mean, really learned what was important to me, like, like real, and I could tell if I was willing to risk the COVID. Now, Andy Ruth, and I already told you, I'm a biomedical engineer, emphasis on the biomedical, listen, they ain't have to explain the virus to me. I got it. Like, okay, um, mm, we're going to mask up, we're going to stay in the house, Instacart, bam. We're not leaving. I'm fine, right? And so, because I am so COVID conservative, and you're very smart about it, not COVID crazy, COVID conservative, I could tell what was important to me as I used all of that knowledge to navigate my way through or to something. For example, my mother, right? I lasted almost six, almost 90 days like i was like i can't do it i've got to see my mother how am i going to do this now she's in her 70s you know i'm in the middle of it covid she's in a different state i listen i put all the scientific details spreadsheet type a everything i had my journey mapped out i knew exactly which gas station i was gonna stop <laughs> like i had gloves i was walked in there looking like i don't know what you know but i realized it was that important. I was going to figure this out. I was going to get there and I was going to not kill my mother in the process right. <laughs> coming across the day. So I learned, you know, I learned those, those things. I also learned to laugh at myself. The yeah. other thing I risked the COVID for, pumpkin latte. <laughs> <laughs> the first time the signs came out, I knew I was going down. I was like, girl, are you going in there to risk the COVID? For a pumpkin latte, mm-hmm, non-fat extra whip. Yes, I am. <laughs> is, that, is that good? Huh? Is it that good? Yeah, I'm sorry. And and it's it only it has a season. Okay. <laughs> it's limited time. So it, it was interesting, right? So we, we learned a lot about ourselves. Hopefully, we learned to laugh at ourselves because I, you know, I was I was laughing at myself. I was like, you are really going in. I was like, I'm really going in there. Um, so, so those kinds of things. You are so right. I um, I also I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna little tidbit out. I'm actually working on a book. I haven't um written in a while, but uh, it's 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 a doozy. It's um it's in the editing stages now. The editor has oh, it. And wow. It's it's really from the heart. I, I'm gonna let you guys know the title. The title is Conquering the Hell Chapters. Ooh. Yeah, Conquering the Hell Chapters. Wow. I almost named the book Get the Hell Out. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> well, I put that in the introduction. I almost named this Get the Hell Out. That, that is in the introduction. I almost named it Get the Hell Out. But then I realized there was so much more for me to experience. There's about 30 Hell Chapters. Um, uh, yeah, girl. <laughs> Oh my! Okay. It's, you know, um, so it it'll be out probably like um, towards the end of April. Oh. So you know, so, so the first part of the chapter is 
you know, you see the, the carnal or the natural side of what, you know, if chapter one is get the hell out, you kind of see what get the hell out means on the natural side. Like, get your hell out of my space, don't want to see you anymore. But then on the spiritual side, which was more the introspection for me, get the hell out meant ridding the negativity that was either in my mind or my heart or surroundings, kind of clearing clearing my path. So it's, it, it's a good journey. But no, I, I think it's, I think that's good. I mean, it, it sounds like it's going to be instructional, kind of like a little guidebook, like, ooh, this <laughs> looking like a chapter 15 day. Let's see how I'm supposed to get out of, of, of chapter 15. But I also want to acknowledge humor aside. I mean, it's, you know, it's two shot shy a masterpiece, right? We've been reading about the nine, this nine circles of hell, you know, for a couple of centuries at, at this, at this moment. Um, and, and to, be frank, if anyone could articulate the new chapters, it probably would be a black woman. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> Sharon, let me ask you this. Um, on the I Call Upon the Elders piece, um, mm. that's the one with the with the woman. Did you um did that one speak to you in it? You know, what what did you get like what hit you in that particular piece? I you mean it. you mean the second the second piece part? Yeah. Um, it, that's 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 uh, the name of it. I like the circles. Mm. I like the fact that our the the face, the woman. I'm assuming it's a woman. Uh -huh. Her face is encircled by so many women. Yeah. She's got all these people surrounding her protecting her and i don't think she knows it you know and she's so she's she you know she may know about the first level but there's that second level there's grandma and then there's the people who who, who didn't even who knew grandma and that generation and the generation that we've never met right so, yeah yeah, I got two bumps as I'm that one. I that was that was the very first piece in the series. Wow, I did because I so I got uh, I gave Tanya a sneak peek because I actually sent her a, re a smaller reproduction um, of it. I was actually painting that as we were caring for mom. So I'd be in the um, in the dining room painting, and my mom and sister might be on the living room sofa just. Just watching me add all those little shells to the piece. Things to visit her. She just wanted to sit and watch the family. So she watched me. She watched the grandchildren. And she just she watched us. And I don't know if you guys saw my YouTube, um, my Facebook video was in like an eight, maybe fifteen second video. I asked mom. I said, Mom, is there anything you really, really want to do? And she said, I want to cook. And so I'm thinking. First of all, mom said, I want to cook. You know. When we think about a black woman cooking, we think like, okay, she wanted to make some greens or something like that. No, she wanted to make some brownies. So um, during that time, sitting there stirring um, the brownie mix, and we made made the brownies. Um, huh. That's a good memory. Oh, that yeah. is. And and when you say that, I can you know I'm starting to sort of pick up some of the the context in in, in the piece, and and I want uh, you know Sharon to to take this as a compliment. When you leaned up to, into the screen and right, you were trying to to get look at the picture. I could see you in the picture, Annie Ruth. Look at look at her. It's it was the the way your glasses were. They imitated the shape of the eyes, and then that is your nose. And then you have these these amazing these amazing cheeks with like stories. And I and so I saw you in the picture, which was the first time I realized that this picture could be a picture of the elder being circled by the elders, right? Because it made me you know, think of it as, as a young person. And it just took me into this space where, you know, little kids, when you're little kids, you're like old people, old people, old people, old people, right? And then the, the closer you get, the philosophy sort of starts to change. And, and now I'm also in this space where I'm in the, please don't leave me, haven't figured it out yet. I am now close enough to understand that the weight of the people is on your shoulder. I don't know the trick. 
so please don't go anywhere sort of until I until I um I feel this and so see so that's what I saw uh when Sharon like leaned up uh close and with, with all those 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 women or ancestors or whatever is going on it's in a halo yeah it's in a halo yeah. and that just said you know sort of sort of so so much um right just <clears throat> just in terms of I'm a very like you know everything for me is kind of integrated into that and so you know when I when I looked and I saw sort of the women as the halo it wasn't like you added women to the halo it was like you revealed what halos are actually made out of oh wow this is what I saw, right listen you asked the poet but she's seeing a picture that's that's what i that's what i saw it was like they were always there it's like oh that makes a whole lot more sense than it just being a band of light yes it does um and so i i really i really liked sort of the, the piece and 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 everything um that it was saying yeah the women have always been there yeah and you know when you think about the, the women on the ships and the women on the plantations, they have always been the strength of the family. They have always been there. They have been mothers to people, to, to other women's children. One woman's taken away and another one will say, okay, you're mine now. Mm -hmm. Women have always been there. And, you know, this is not a new thing. This is generational all the way back to the beginning the women have always been there and women know this yes i don't know how many men are aware of it but the women we know this and yes. this picture says that well and let me ask y'all something do you think knowing me personally gives you a better understanding of the piece or you, you don't think it really matters no I don't think that it should matter. I mean, the fact that I know you makes me like it, but I, would have, I mean, but I would have liked it even if I didn't know who did it. If I just saw it and somebody said, what do you think of this? I said, wow, that's deep. Ooh, ooh, I love the shells. Ooh, that's, ooh, 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 I, I can see this. And I would have thought in the layers, it would have brought to my mind poetry okay <laughs> and so you know because i see in words but it spoke to me and it doesn't matter that you know it's it doesn't say this is an any ruth book this is this is a beautiful picture of the power and the history of women on mm -hmm. this earth you know from day one and i would say for, for me knowing you adds layers right you know it's, it's you know, when we think about the way we teach art or the way we teach understanding literature you got to know who the author was or the artist was and the time that they were living and sort of all that kind of stuff so you can have the full context but you know it's 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 very interesting while i would say knowing you adds nuances and and layers to, to what i'm understanding when you, particularly when you fill in the backstory I would also say, even as I think about that, there is a level of authentic vulnerability in your art that I don't know if you're being deliberate about or not. It's pretty obvious who painted this, right? Like you, you, may, not, you may not necessarily know, know the details. Um, and you're, it's not just that you are just painting your story, you're painting a much bigger story, our story, their story, her story, and all that kind of stuff. But there is enough of you that you are willing to put into that so that the viewer is is not guessing, right? I mean, you, you basically told kind of, this is what I think is important. This is what I value. This is where some of my strength come from. This is where some of my pain comes from. This is how I'm feeling today is, is, is in there in a way that I think when I'm thinking about particular artist or particular art, that you really have to, to give the student a whole, you know, two page bio and some context, right? Because the artist is trying to hide something, right? There's a context, sort of that kind of thing. And, and then you can help the student get into it, but you are putting so much, um, I think in this and, and on top of that, that knowing you is as much, I think a confirmation 
of my experience with the art um, as it as it adds uh, things things to it. I see this as a tribute to your mother, Annie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this is your gift of love to your mother and her mother and her mother and her mother and you don't even know who those mothers are but all of them all of the mothers my mother tanya's mother their mothers the mothers that came before it's a tribute to to women and to moms and to oh mothers. man you I mean, it on the head because as i was painting it my sister was there and even though i titled it i called upon the elders she looked at it and she she immediately said, "I see our ancestors." You know, she she kind of just zoned in, like, this, you know, this is what I see. You know, my, mom, when it came to my artwork, she, every time, ever since I was like a little girl, her yeah. her encouragement would always be, "That's pretty, baby." So <laughs> I, I draw I draw a picture and she say, "That's pretty, baby," and it just encouraged me to do some more. And so even when uh, I was sitting there putting all those shells and fabric, I specifically grabbed a different piece of fabric for every particular woman that was in that. Do you know how long that I was sitting there kind of sorting through uh, through fabric at the dining room table, just just really pulling that out. But you you said something very special about the poetry. So I'm a, so y'all y'all are poets, y'all natural poets. I'm gonna put y'all on the spot. On. You can't be putting nobody on the spot. I specifically sent you an email and asked, <laughs> did I need to be ready? All this means is that she's ready. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. All that means is that mama is probably prepared and she is going first. <laughs> well, I had a feeling that she was going to ask this. All right, where's the one that I got? I had a good one marked. <laughs> All right. Okay. This one is called Woman of Color. Today, I became a woman of color, culturally reclassified, labeled with a fine tip marker, stuffed into a bland beige file folder with all the other full-toned, bright-hued, flame-tinted women of the world. I was advised by my monochromatic legal counsel that I would henceforth be allowed to groan with dark desires, soak with gloomy scowls, mourn with shadowy tears, but never again should I attempt to blanch pale with fear, blush bright with expectation, or grow sick with ghostly pallor. I'm already known as a colorful woman. Fiery red passion, deep purple demands and streaks of golden gray hair. But now I've been painted into a prismatic portrait, my image reflected in the duplicated faces of the mosaic of women around me. Are we individuals like the tawny colors in a Crayola, Crayola box or blended like discarded watercolors in a glass, washed together in an obedient dirty brown hue? No. We, the women of color, a combustible volcano erupt from the edges of the dull appellation, explode from the confines of the common category. I boldly sing with my sisters in painted tones of terracotta, black sweet anthems of blue, honey right sunrise songs, turquoise hymns of silver praise. We scream with dark intensity. I shout with golden rage. See me, hallelujah, see me. Turkey. 
hidden between pieces of celery or simmering in the gravy pot. No, love is not in the turkey. Kind of shot, though. Love ain't in the bread. Cornbread, pumpkin bread, banana bread, baked with love, right? Bread. Hawaiian rolls, yeast rolls. Grandmas, call me for the last step of this recipe rolls that must be served hot. No, surprisingly not. Love ain't in the bread. We were worried that year. Started playing the music, watching the movies in early November. Committing to remember what this is supposed to look like. The debates, the disagreements, the marching, the madnesses, the bubbles, the isolation, the unmasking of differences. In hope, in fear, here comes more shouting. There goes another tear. The hospitals, the funerals. <laughs> that year, we struggled through broken hearts, cracked spirits, shaking souls. How exactly are we supposed to survive this without corn pudding and zucchini casserole? But then that night came, reminding the people of way out of no way that the root of holiday is holy. Those hands meant for slicing potatoes, these fingers meant for snapping beans, started Zoom calls, adjusted headsets, while arms meant to carry folding tables, move laptops and mock desk sets. Little legs and tall chairs still swinging back and forth. Little legs and tall chairs standing by as tech support. Eyes meant to measure dashes of cinnamon, retask acumen to scan squares on computer screens, stretching smiles into virtual borders, calling the moment to order. And then finally, finally, that year, love got clarity. It was only in the turkey because hands waving at you from six feet away stuffed it in there on Tuesday, because the eyes winking top left of your screen laid it by the gravy on the serving tray. It's the stuff of deep bones, deep enough to risk burning down a home as makeshift pliers dipped in smoked turkey deep fryers. Bless and base that charred bird taste that made two weeks of prep and two days of dirty dishes worth it in the first place. That's not just the salt we taste. No, love was never in the turkey, hidden among the celery, ain't lost in the absence of sublimely baked pies and sweet rolls, wasn't even in the missing casseroles. Love, right where it has been all these years, just mark the calendar, nod to the history books, and raise a glass. Cheers. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm loving our conversation, but I'm I'm not going to belabor our audience because I want them to come back for our, some more episodes as we do more talking and sharing. Um, but I just want to thank everybody for joining us yes. on this evening. I tell you, I have pulled out and been blessed to pull out the best of the best of sisters, oh. uh, not only in the whole literary field, but the best of the best of sisters from the heart. Kisses to y'all. Thanks for being here with me. Mm. <laughs> I got it. They are soaked in. All right. Until next time, y'all. Y'all be blessed. And we'll see you on Conversations with Annie Ruth. Yeah.